Welcome. This is a public affairs forum sponsored by the First Unitarian Universalist Church of Austin, Texas. We take these uh, shows uh, here at our sanctuary uh, located in North Central Austin, 4700 Grover, and we would invite you to come join us. My name is Luther Elmore. We've been holding these uh, forums since 1954 when the church was first incorporated, and they're sponsored to nourish our minds and spirit to lead us to greater social service and justice. Come join us Sundays at noon uh, here at our sanctuary. Information about the forums can be uh, obtained on our church website, austinuu.org. Today we're very happy to have with us Dr. Robert Mace. Dr. Mace is an associate director and chief water policy officer at the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment at Texas State University. And he's also a professor of practice in the Department of Geology at Texas State. Dr. Mace has over 30 years of experience in hydrology, hydrogeology, and water, primarily in Texas. Before joining Texas State in 2017, Dr. Mace worked at the Texas Water Development Board for 17 years, ending his career there as the Deputy Executive Administrator for the Water Science and Conservation Office. Prior to joining the Texas Water Development Board, he worked nine years at the Bureau of Economic Geology at the University of Texas at Austin as a hydrologist and research scientist. He has a BS in geophysics and an MS in hydrology from the New Mexico Institute of Mining and Technology, and a PhD in hydrology from the University of Texas at Austin. Today, Dr. Mace will tell us and we have a story of, once, of water conservation in his own life and at his own household, and share with us tips on water conservation. We're very honored to have with us today Dr. Robert Mace. Thank you. Good to see we have the cream of the crop here today. That's great. <laughs> and I'm happy to be here to talk about water conservation with you all. Um, I, I call this spousal experiments in water conservation because um, um, I've done some experiments on my wife in terms, of <laughs> in terms of water conservation, as well as myself. I'm an equal opportunity experimenter. Um, and, uh, and I also call it spousal experiments because a lot of the uh, hindrances for us using water more efficiently is uh, um, kind of kind of social constructs or, or habits um, um, and how we treat or have a relationship with water. And so to use water more efficiently, we kind of need to look inward and, and, and think about how are we using water and is this really the best way we should be using water and can we use water more efficiently? And so, uh, so that, that's kind of the big message that I have here. Um, as was mentioned, I'm with the Meadows Center for Water and the Environment. I retired from the state uh, Halloween of last year. It was a scary party. And uh, went here to the Meadows Center um, so I can uh, be involved in, in research that uh, helps ensure clean, abundant water for the environment and all humanity. And so. And so that's the other kind of component what I'm talking about today is that if we use water more efficiently, we conserve water, there's going to be more water for, for the, all the new Texans that are coming in, but also for the environment. Um, you know, Texas has to watch for that balance between taking care of people and taking care of the environment. And so, so I'm pleased to, uh, I mean, that's kind of what my career has been about and pleased to continue that at Texas State University. Um, water is important. The uh, this little cartoon here says, there is no life without water because without water there's no coffee, and without coffee I'll kill you all. Um, it's, you know, it's a, cl it's a cliche about how important water is, but, but it is important. Uh, it feeds our agriculture, where our food comes from. It feeds our industry. Um, it's often uh, very important for power supplies, um, for businesses, as well as for our households. And so, you know, we don't have water, we're not going to have a healthy economy, a healthy environment, uh, and a healthy place to live. So, so the outline is that I'm going to start broad and talk about Texas, kind of kind of set the table for why this is an important topic, bring it down and talk about Austin. And, and I'm, um, I'm one of the members of the Austin Water Forward Task Force that's planning out 100 years for Austin, which has been a fascinating um, um, exercise. Then broadly, I'm going to talk about kind of how Texans use water in their homes, and then I'm going to talk about the good stuff, the experiments on my spouse, when I talk about our, our, our personal home. 
and and I'm hoping to hoping to inspire you all to uh, perhaps look at your own water use and consumption and, and think about hey how could I use water more efficiently um, to uh, you know increase our supply take better care of the environment um, also it can help you you know have more money in your wallet as well um, if the environment and and more Texans don't motivate you so let's talk about Texas and uh, Texas, as you know, if you've, you've been around for a week or two, is growing rapidly. I mean, I, I've uh, last several weeks I've been, uh, you know, kind of driving um, from the south into town, and it's just jaw dropping every time I see the skyline. It's just it's starting to look like a, like a mini New York City. Even over at West Campus, there's certain angles. If you're coming northbound on Mopac, you know, just just a couple weeks ago, I was like, what the heck is that? You know, where? <laughs> I don't recognize that. That's not downtown. It's West Campus. Lots of high rises going up. People moving into Texas. It's like a thousand to twelve hundred people a day. And over the next fifty years, we expect to go from about thirty million today to f over fifty million by 2070. Um, I call it every Oklahoman's worst nightmare. Um, there's a lot more people coming, and all those people are going to want a glass of water. Now, according to the state water plan, when we look at the big statewide picture, um, during a repeat of the drought of record, which is what our water planning plans for, and for much of the state, it's the drought of the 1950s. Um, Luther mentioned that, uh, I guess, these forums started in 54. Um, surely there were probably discussions about water back then because um, from uh, you know, 1950, about 57 was a, a really massive drought in the state. Um, but different parts of the state have uh, different droughts record. In fact, Austin just recently exceeded the 1950s drought with the drought between 2011 and 2015 in terms of its impacts on flows in the Colorado River. But looking statewide, um, our demand for water, what we need for water, um, factoring in increased population, is much greater than the supplies of water we have during a repeat of the drought record, which is not good. So if we have a statewide repeat of drought record conditions, there will be people that will go dry. You know, we came really close with this last drought. We did quite well, actually, um, but we still came really close. Uh, this last drought, to uh, rival the drought of the 1950s on a statewide basis, would have had to have gone on two more years. Um, so it kind of puts the, the drought of record of the 50s in the context there. So there's a need to get need to find more water for the state. Now, where's that water going to come from? And it comes from com a number of sources. And uh, about 30% of it is going to come from uh, what, what's called demand management. Um, and so demand management is water conservation, essentially. And then there's also drought uh, management. So if you remember the recent drought, you were told you can only water your grass uh, once a week. Uh, you couldn't uh, wash your car. Um, those, those would be drought management conditions or, or part of demand management. So going out um, seven or 50 years, you know, 30% of water is expected to come from demand management. And then the rest of it is from um, uh, reservoirs, groundwater wells, desalination, um, um, reuse, um, kind of taking treated wastewater and reusing it again. If you see purple pipes in the parks around town, that's treated wastewater. It's being used to irrigate. And then also something called other surface water which for the most part is paper water. It's like re-signing a contract to get water from a reservoir, or from a river, you know, from somebody that actually owns the water. If you take that other surface water out, um, the demand management is 43%. Now, some folks would consider water reuse as water conservation. And uh, if you throw the water reuse in there, 42% um, of our future water supplies are going to come from conservation and reuse. Um, and if you set aside other surface water, that's 60%. So moral of the story is, is water conservation is going to be an important part of our water supply going forward. So let's talk about Austin. Um, as I mentioned, Austin, um, really inspired by the drought of 2011 to 2015, there was concerns that the drought management plan that Austin had going into the drought um, could have told people there was no outdoor watering and, and people were concerned about losing their trees because of that. Uh, there was a, a group put together to, to look at the drought management plan. They also made some recommendations. And one recommendation was Austin should put together a task force to look at, f at 
future water needs 100 years out. So the state water planning, which consists of regional water planning groups, which Austin feeds into, looks out 50 years. But Austin's like, let's look out 100 years, um, which, I, which I thought was a, a very cool thing. Um, my council member, um, once there was a vacancy, appointed me to, uh, to fulfill this role. Because um, I've often wondered, like, we plan for 50 years, but what happens 100 years out? So this was, this was really exciting for me. The first thing when I was getting briefed up by city staff that caused my jaw to drop was the projections of population increases for Austin. Now, these numbers I'm going to give you, they are Austin proper. We're not talking about the bedroom communities around us. This is Austin proper. Austin proper today is about a million people, which is south of that. Uh, 50 years, and we're expecting to be 2 million people. So we're going to double in 50 years. In 100 years, we're expected to be 4 million people. If you can imagine that, um, you know, my, my first reaction to that was, golly, we're going to be living on top of each other. Not that I'm going to be alive in uh, 2115, although I hope to be. <laughs> but the way, way I eat brisket, probably not. Um, but, uh, you know, I kind of asked, I'm like, gosh, how dense are we going to be? And the city did an analysis, and, and our density is expected to be kind of Los Angeles-style density, which isn't terribly uh, dense. It's not San Francisco density, um, but, uh, but still, 3 million more people in the city of Austin. Um, and they're also going to want a glass of water to boot. The, the other jaw dropper for me getting involved with Austin Water Forward was uh, the projection on what's going to happen to the, to our reservoir. So Austin is pretty much 100% reliable, reliant on the Highland Lakes, um, Lake Travis and uh, Buchanan. And this, this plot I'm showing up here is showing the uh, um, um, how full the Highland Lake reservoirs are going back to uh, the early 40s. Uh, you know, in the drought of the 50s, the storage in those reservoirs, conservation storage means storage in the reservoirs for, for human use, um, you know, got pretty close to uh, uh, 600,000 acre feet per year. Acre feet is the, the term that uh, water resource managers use. An acre uh, foot is uh, an acre with a foot of water on it. That's about 326,000 gallons. Um, five acre feet on a on an acre and an acre is about a football field that's kind of like how the UT football team's been playing lately you know, fighting through five feet of water um, but you can see see the 1950s drought got down about 600,000 you don't hear people talk about the drought in the early 60s but the reservoirs also got down to about that level in uh, 65 and then the recent drought 2011 to 2015 uh, we were flirting with getting down to that level um, and, and this this includes Georgetown and Stillhouse Hollow, so it, it puts a little more water in there. Um, so the question is, is that uh, as Austin's population grows, um, what is that going to do to reservoir levels? The other factor that's being included in here is climate change in the city's process. Uh, the state water plan doesn't explicitly address climate change, um, although individual communities and planning groups can. But Austin's uh, factoring in climate change. And this is, this is what it shows. So, so out in 2115, um, what the uh, kind of engineers did was they took climate change projections and then ran the period of record um, through um, 2115. So you know, who knows exactly what the weather's going to be like today in 2115. Um, but, uh, but if you kind of look at a repeat of, of uh, um, climate conditions, with the increased population, increased demand on the reservoirs, what we see is that we go below 600,000 um, and, uh, and possibly very close to emptying out the reservoirs, maybe about 100,000 acre feet left. Um, when you add climate change on top of this, and, and actually this is, this is pretty much a good, this is good news here because without climate change, we're good 100 years out. We're probably going to need to do something to make sure we don't go below 600,000. Um, and again, this is assuming that droughts in the future aren't going to be worse than the ones we have in the past. But when we add climate change on top, um, the reservoirs, there's a good chance our reservoirs go completely dry uh, unless we find alternative sources of water. You know, this is, this is not good. You know, if, in, 
with climate change and repeating the uh, historical climate record, you know, the Highland Lakes go dry for multiple years. Um, so that's, that's pretty sobering. Four million people, the lake's potentially going dry. Now where the, the plan is heading, so this Austin Water Forward Plan, um, we're in the process as a committee of identifying what Austin can do to get more water. And then later on this year, that's going to get finalized and then sent to the uh, city council for approval. And what I'm showing here is that um, water conservation uh, makes up a large part of that. So there's water loss control, which is uh, making sure your pipes aren't losing too much water. Um, there's landscape ordinances, you know, to use water more efficiently outside, such as xeriscaping, irrigation incentives, stormwater, rainwater harvesting, gray water harvesting, lot scale, wastewater reuse, um, air conditioning, condensate reuse. That's going to be an important part uh, going forward. Also shown up here is aquifer storage and recovery, which is it basically would be taking water out of the river and stored it underground. You know, when we have excess uh, river water, we can put underground. And then um, brackish groundwater des desalination, so salty groundwater we can pull up and treat. And then uh, more, more reuse, taking treated wastewater and, and reusing that. And some other things are listed up here as well. Now, Austin's been, uh, been doing pretty good with respect to using water more efficiently. You know, our population between 1990 and 2015 has grown from about 550,000 to about a million people. And our water demand between 1990 and 2000 was, was going up as the population was going up. Since, uh, since 2000, we've seen our, our usage of water, our demand for water flatten out. And then during the drought, because of drought restrictions, we've actually seen it go down. So, so this, is, this is great. Um, it means that we're, you know, in Austin, we're starting to take our water use seriously. We're using it more efficiently. We're conserving it. Um, and, and that actually is saving us money in the, in the long haul. Now, folks will complain, certainly in my neighborhood, they've complained a lot about increasing water bills. And, uh, you know, for, for water utility, they sell water. So it's difficult for them to encourage people to not buy what they're selling. You know, imagine Apple coming out. We've got this great new iPhone. We don't want you to buy it. <laughs> you know, and that just doesn't go, go over too well. So to compensate, Austin does have to raise rates. Um, that can make people very upset. Um, but, but trust me that new water supplies are going to cost a whole heck of a lot more than, than the increase in your water bill from, from conserving water. Um, water that you can conserve is, is almost always the, the cheapest water, the less, least expensive water going forward. But there's more Austin can do, for sure. So let's talk about our homes. So um, this is a, a, a chart showing per capita water usage. So um, it's called uh, what the cool kids call GPCD, gallons per capita daily. And what, uh, what the state does and, and communities will do is they'll take like the total usage in a city, which generally is like what the people are using, um, what uh, institutions in the city are using, um, and then also like what businesses and restaurants are using, and then divide that by the population. That's called a total gallons per capita daily. Um, and so if you're, if you're in this subculture, and maybe you've seen newspaper articles in the past where Dallas gets beat up for being water hogs and being, being uh, um, using too much water, and so you see, just looking at total, you know, Dallas shows up at 213 gallons per person per day. Uh, Midland's actually higher at 235 gallons per person per day. Austin comes in at 171 gallons per day. Um, now, remember that this is like, you know, like, like at the church here. I don't know if the church irrigates or not, but, you know, people come to the church, they're using the toilets, they're getting a glass of water to drink. Um, maybe there's people coming from outside of Austin to come to church here, and they're using the toilets, or maybe they stop off at the gym in Austin, Hyde Park Gym or something, and before they head out to Bastrop. Well, all that water use gets added onto you as Austinites with this total GPCD. Um, what's, what's maybe a fair metric is 
what the residential GPCD is. So what are people using in single family homes? And what's interesting about that is Dallas looks a lot better. 95 gallons per person per day. El Paso at 98. Uh, San Antonio at 92. Um, Austin at 102. Um, so Dallasites themselves really aren't uh, water hogs. In fact, they're using less water. This is 2008 numbers, which are the most recent numbers I have. They're actually using less water on a residential basis than folks in Austin. Um, look at Midland, 159 gallons per person per day. Uh, it's dry out there, and they like their green grass, so they are watering all the time. And then, interestingly enough, Houston, 65. For the major cities, they have the lowest gallons per capita daily. And they, they do very little with respect to getting people to conserve water. You, you, you know why? It rains so much there. They don't have to, <laughs> they don't have to water their yards. Um, so, so keep that in mind, but, but it does kind of give us a metric. There's people who would argue that even this metric of residential gallons per capita per day is not a good metric of how efficiently we're using water. You know, Houston could certainly do better than 65. Um, and, uh, and, and probably it's best to just compare your value to yourself. But it's not bad to kind of peek over and see what your neighbors are doing, as long as you understand why their numbers are the way they are. Um, during the drought, when I was at the Water Development Board, I was getting calls from the press about uh, how much water households or Texans use on their lawns. And interestingly enough, there wasn't a study uh, on that about Texas. Now, there had been a study comparing uh, winter usage to summer usage. And what that study showed was that uh, Texans use twice as much water in the summer than they do in the winter, um, on average, because people are watering their gardens or watering their yards. Um, but, but I knew it wasn't accurate to say that half of our water is used outdoors because you know, you ramp up in the spring with your water use and you ramp down in the fall with your water use if you're watering outside. And so um, Sam Hermit and I did a study looking at the major cities of Texas. And what we found was about, about a third of the water is used outside. And this is averaged over a year. About a third is used outside and two thirds is used inside. Um, and I think that's important to know. There's a big assumption that most of the water that we use in Texas is used outside. Um, and it's important to know just in terms of uh, maybe knowing where to focus with uh, water programs at, at cities or communities in terms of getting people to use water more efficiently going forward. What's interesting about this split is uh, this is also the, almost exactly the same numbers for the nation, the nation in terms of how folks across the country are using water. Now that varies, you know. Um, Austin is, uh, is about this split, um, about uh, one-third out, outside over a year, two-thirds inside. You go out to Midland, Odessa, um, Amarillo, uh, half of their water is used outside, half is inside. Um, not a uh, big culture of, of conserving water out there. <laughs> um, and then Houston, of course, when you get, get to the rainier parts of the state, it's a little less. Uh, the other interesting thing is that an average household water use in Texas is about 95 gallons per person per day. Um, so I'll round that up to make it easy to 100. So on, a, so on an average day, you know, about 30 gallons indoors, 70 gallons outdoors uh, per person. And that's also pre-equivalent to a nationwide number. Um, how many of y'all keep an Excel spreadsheet of your uh, water use? Oh, good for you. I've been been doing that for 20 years, just just tracing. Uh, it's a good thing to do because, um, yeah, in, in the house that we had before we have the house now was uh, built in the 1880s, pier and beam, and, and it had sprung a leak underneath the house that uh, we couldn't tell, and it was a pretty serious leak, and we couldn't tell it was leaking until I got the water bill and I had a spike and use was like, what is going on, you know? And I crawled underneath the house, and sure enough, and even worse, it was a hot water line that was, <laughs> was leaking. But So it's a good reason to keep track, but also keep track just in terms of you know, just kind of measuring how, how good we're doing. When I, I started doing that when I started working at the Water Development Board and became educated about um, um, P 
people how much water people use. I was just curious how I compared to uh, to other people. Um, and, I, and I told my boss, and, and uh, I'm trying to think, I think our water usage was maybe 65, 70 for that house, gallons per person per day. And I told my boss, and he goes, oh, heck, that's nothing. You know, I'm down, I'm down around 40. And, uh, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, he lives in Pflugerville. He's got a lot of St. Augustine that's very green. He's got, got four grubby kids. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking to myself, that's bull malarkey. But he's the boss. So I'm like, wow, that's great. Um, several months later, he came in the work and he goes, holy cow. I said, what? And he said, uh, well, turns out my meter was, his meter wasn't working properly. <laughs> <laughs> and so once they fixed the meter and he got an accurate reading of his water use, you know, he had to start uh, taking things a little more seriously on his water consumption. Um, so here's Austin. And this is, uh, this is total for Austin. So it's it's so residential indoor usage is about 50% of where all the water in Austin goes. Um, outdoor usage in total is about uh, 22%, and then non-residential indoor is about 30%. If you take this off and compare the residential indoor and the outdoor, you can kind of see this is about half of the residential indoor. So it's about that 30 to 70% split that we see. Um, so, so most of our usage is, is actually indoor. Um, that's what 80% um, across the across the city uh, versus outdoor. And again, that just kind of gives you some information on perhaps maybe where the focus should be um, or could be looking to save water. So let's first talk about outdoor. 78% um, of Texans live in urban areas. Um, 25 to 50% of urban water use is for outdoor uses, and that's primarily lawns. Um, lawns, grass, is the largest irrigated crop in the United States, um, four times as much as corn. Um, in fact, turf consumes more water than the next seven crops combined. So just think about the, you know, the Ogallala Aquifer in West Texas and fields and fields being irrigated with groundwater or the wild, or not the wild rice, but the rice down in the lower basin that, that uh, folks get upset about. You know, why are we growing rice in Texas? But it's really the turf that is uh, consuming a lot of our outdoor water use. Sadly, uh, the estimate is, is about half of that um, irrigation is, is um, over irrigation. People tend to over irrigate their um, their lawns. Um, just you know, just to make sure that uh, things don't don't die. I've also heard that uh, you know a lot of people have smart meters or have landscape people come, and the landscape people know they're not going to get a call back or a complaint if uh, if they overwater because you know if they underwater then they're going to get calls. It's going to be more work, so they just tend to overwater. Uh, there was an article in the Texas Water Journal about a resident in Huntsville. Um, so about 1,300 residents they took a look at. Average rainfall in Huntsville is 49 inches a year. That's a lot of rain. Um, Austin's, Austin's about, what, 36, I think. Um, in that particular neighborhood, 64% was used outdoors. My guess is this is probably a well-off neighborhood. There's a socioeconomic signal on water use. Uh, richer people tend to put more water on their outdoor yards um, versus poor people. Tend, you know, richer people tend to have bigger yards, can afford to pay the uh, the higher water bills, and so they tend to use more water. 99.51% of yards were overwatered. <laughs> so just about everybody. And 12% uh, of those 1,300 residences were over irrigated by at least 100,000 gallons in at least one month during the three year study. So, some people really, really over water. And there tends to be a long tail on folks that, uh, that use water for outdoors, outdoor usage. So, let's move to indoor use. And um, the averages for indoor use across the United States are such that the, the toilet uses 27%. Uh, of, uh, of, of the water inside a household. Uh, here in the land of Tex-Mex, that might be ho slightly higher. Um, 
clothes washers, about 22%. Showers, 17%. Um, faucets, 16%. Leaks, 14%. So that's just leaks in your household, not in the city distribution system, but from the meter to your house. Um, and it, this could be a leaking toilet that's, that's uh, uh, leaking water, doesn't have a good seal, a dripping faucet, or you know a line that's underneath your house that's actually leaking, or, or the line from the street to your house that's leaking, 14%. Um, other, not sure what that is, just you know, water balloons maybe. Um, <laughs> Baths, 1.7%, dishwasher, 1.4%. All right, so let's, uh, let's talk about the, my wife and myself home, or our home. And uh, I'm going to show you the punchline up front on uh, what living in a water-efficient home looks like. Um, when I worked for the state, um, I had a friend who was kind enough to share her water bills with me. She lives in Circle C with her husband and her two cute kids. Um, when you take the, their water use over a full year, uh, this is for 2013, it's about 111 gallons per person per day. So a little higher than a normal uh, Texan or an average Texan, but, but still pretty close, I think pretty typical. And what you see here is in the winter months, um, there's a, you use about 5,000 gallons per day, which actually is not bad for four people. Um, if you're at about 1,000 gallons per person um, um, for a month in the winter months, you're doing pretty good. That's a good rule of thumb. Um, and then the summer comes, and um, you know, in June, their uh, water bill, their water consumption goes from 5,000 gallons a month to 15,000 gallons. Water bill goes from $26 to $102. And then you hit the peak of summer where they were using more than 35,000 gallons and had a water bill of $347. Um, and then kind of faded back to uh, background usage, but not quite, I'm not sure what was going on. Uh, she mentioned that at some point they put in one of those, you know, 50 shower head nozzle sh things, so maybe that's what happened. Um, and so for the entire year, a uh, family of four, they used 162,500 gallons, and that water cost $1,205. Now my wife and I were fortunate enough to build build a new house and we, we paid attention on the water efficiency side as well as the energy efficiency side. My wife works in the uh, Wendy, she works in the power industry. I like to tell people we have a utilitarian marriage because so we got, got the power utility and the water utility covered there. Um, and this is what our water bills look like. Now it's not for 2013, it's for 2014, but it, it doesn't really matter um, and the key thing is, is we don't use any city water outside, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, we used, you know, right around 2,000 gallons a month, and uh, our highest bill was in August was 18 bucks, um, compared to $347 that my friend had. Uh, instead of using 162,000 gallons, we used um, 26,000 gallons. Um, and even if you kind of added in, say, two more people, we'd still be at 50,000 gallons instead of 162,000 gallons. And instead of paying $1,200 over the year for water, we paid $187. City of Austin probably hates us, actually. <laughs> They're probably losing money on us um, for having such low, low water bills. Our lowest water bill was $13 in March of that year. Um, it's two people, but we, you know, at the time I put this, put the graphic together, we had three cute cats. We now have four, which means our gallons per mammal per day are, is now down to 11. Um, so very impressive. All right, so how did we do it? Um, and I want to preface this by saying that, yes, we built a new house. Um, yes, we're in a higher socioeconomic level than a lot of people. But a lot of what we did, um, I think, can be adopted um, by, by anybody. Um, except probably maybe on the out on the outdoors, which it, t it takes to do zero scaping right. You need you need deep pockets. Um, but outdoors, we zero scaped. We did rainwater harvesting. Rainwater harvesting can take some money as well. And then we did something called wicking gardens. And again, our goal was to not use any water city water outside. And then indoors, you know, we 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 weren't rabid looking for the lowest. Um, 
um, fixture or the fixture that could produce the lowest amount of water or the dishwasher that did the lowest amount of water. We just made sure it was energy sense or water sense rated. And then, and then um, we have this very blocky modern house, so we're, we're aesthetically driven as well. And so we just, is it water sense and does it look good? Let's get it. Um, and so we had efficient appliances, efficient fixtures, and then uh, shorter showers, and at least one of us. My wife has not been very cooperative on the showers. <laughs> Um, so on the xeriscaping side, um, you know, we minimized turf, and whatever turf we put in, um, it was um, drought tolerant, and uh, and then we were, were unconcerned about letting it go dormant in the the thick of summer, and and going dormant means it turns brown, um, which you know my wife's got some good German blood in her, and we it took some convincing not to water the grass through the summer. Um, it, it really hurt as a uh, tea sipper to put in Aggie Zoysia, but we put in Aggie Zoysia, which is this right here. Uh, the other cool thing about this Zoysia is you can, it only grow oh, six to eight inches tall. And it looks good, it's bushy, and you don't have to, you, then you don't have to mow it. So I can be inside drinking a cocktail, um, watching my neighbor in 110 degree weather pushing his push mower around. Um, it's kind of nice. You know, we also worked to capture stormwater um, so you can do that through rain gardens which is kind of contouring your yard to capture runoff to um, um, encourage deep infiltration and then uh, our driveway ironically most of the turf in our yard is in our driveway so we have this uh, plastic um, stuff that you can drive on um, that grass grows through and then you know I would say people have different uh, feelings about xeriscaping there's there's a certain crowd they just like that nice you know, turf, uh, nicely cut St. Augustine. Um, but, uh, you know, if, if xeriscaping's done well, um, it looks it looks very beautiful, I think. And again, it can be very low maintenance um, and, uh, you know, be aesthetically uh, beautiful. Rainwater harvesting. We also, so not using any city water outside, we need an alternative water supply. And so we went rainwater harvesting. And again, I was working for the state water development board. And uh, one of the one of the programs I worked with was rainwater harvesting, and in our old house we uh, put in an 800 gallon tank, um, and uh, you know beautiful tank, um, but what shocked me with that tank was how fast that water went. Um, and I tell people rainwater harvesting kind of re-engineers or rewires your DNA, in the sense that. You know, one, it's like, I, you know, this is my water. You know, I caught it. city can't tell me what to do. The state can't tell me what to do. The president can't tell me it's my water. And, and, and it becomes, you feel like it's precious at that point, you know. And then your heart sinks when you see how fast it goes in the, in the, uh, the dead of, of summer. Um, and so, uh, you know, so one thing I learned from that house is I need a bigger tank. Um, you know, we're going to need a bigger tank. I shut I showed this picture of the tank to my uh, grandmother, and, uh, and she's looking at it, and she goes, did you really paint your house purple? That was her response. To <laughs> <laughs> she, wasn't, she wasn't too impressed with the tank. So here's the, uh, the new house, and we put in a 5,000-gallon tank uh, in the house there, and that's and that's still, and we, f we feed that tank off of a garage roof, so about a 400-square-foot roof. Uh, it fills up during the winter months, and then there's been enough water in it for us to water outdoor plants. We don't use it on the, you can kind of see that Aggie Zoysia here. We don't use it on the turf because once once you start watering turf, that water, it's thousands and thousands of gallons. It's unbelievable how much water turf takes. Um, and, you know, I kind of understand the turf. It's kind of nice to have some place to go roll around if you want to go roll around in the grass. And so, you know, we've got we've got a sizable chunk here. Um, we have, my, my, my wife is very much into rainwater harvesting. Um, we're, we're looking to get some more put on our house. Um, after we moved into the new place, you know, I came out one day and, and she was uh, cleaning the picnic table and she had the hose hooked up to the house. So she was using city water to clean the picnic table. And I look over the tank and the tank, tank was full. We have like a, something called a level later. It doesn't show up here, but it shows you where the water level is in the tank and the tank's full. I'm like, honey, what are you doing? And she's like, well, I don't want to waste the rainwater. 
<laughs> so, so but that's good, you know. It's like, um, you know, she's a true believer in the rainwater harvesting, and we're going to get more. With the rainwater harvesting, you can also kind of do reuse, and so um, uh, this is my beautiful burnt orange element sitting on top of that uh, pervious driveway that I showed you earlier with the grass growing through it. And uh, this is a hose that's feeding off of that rainwater tank I showed you earlier, using it to establish some trees. But I can also use it to water, or I'm sorry, wash the cars. And, uh, and then the water that comes off the car can actually then water the, the turf that's, uh, that's in the driveway. So it's kind of a, it's a reuse of that, that water. I've also learned, and it's, and I, I, wa I wash the cars with flower pots, <laughs> two gallon ones, you know, fill them up and then kind of pour them on and you know, I can wash a car with about eight to 10 gallons of, of water with the flower pots. Um, you gotta be kind of strong to do that, but, but it, it certainly can be done. The other thing that we did, and, and I highly recommend this, is uh, wicking gardens. And, uh, and a wicking garden is a, is a garden that um, pulls water from underneath, so it wicks it up, kind of like a paper towel. You hold it in a, in a puddle and the water comes up, Capil capillarity. A uh, wicking garden does the same thing. And the way we put ours together is we got a, um, um, a, a livestock watering trough. Um, we got ours from Callahan's, but you can go to your favorite livestock place. Fill it halfway up with pea gravel with a, a access tube to where you can put water into it. Then you drill a hole right above the uh, pea gravel so, so it doesn't completely fill up with water and, and uh, sog your plants. Put down landscape material on top of the pea gravel. You then lay down soil. Then you can plant your plants and put a bunch of mulch on it. And then we use the rainwater to top these things off. And then it, it spills out. We know it's full. And then you can just let them sit. Um, and the great thing about, uh, and you know, you can kind of get arty about how you set them up. Um, but the great thing about um, watering this way is like, like if you have an in-ground garden or even a raised bed garden, and, and you're in the middle of summer, you're... I mean, I don't know about your gardens, but I was like out there having the water every day. Um, uh, with this in the dead of summer, twice a week at most. I call it cocktail friendly gardening because you never have to set your cocktail down because it's sitting up, you know, two feet. It's easy to weed. Uh, if you put enough uh, mulch down, you don't have to weed. So I just go out there twice a week. Like right now, I'm only having to do it once a week. Once it gets hot, twice a week. And the plants absolutely love it. They're getting rainwater, um, and they're getting a, a constant supply of water from underneath. So let's talk about indoor use. Um, so again, we chose Energy Star rated appliances. And generally, appliances that are energy efficient are also water efficient, because a lot of these appliances have to warm up the water. and so. The less they do in warming up water, um, the better, and that results in a benefit in using less water. Um, this is an interesting quote, um, where modern dishwashers use 17 times less water than hand washing, than average hand washing. And the reason is, is a modern dishwasher uses about three gallons per cycle, and a cycle is basically a load. Three gallons. There's a lot of built-in uh, water reuse these days. Um, with uh, uh, dishwashers. As you saw from a previous plot, there's not a lot of water that goes towards uh, dishwashing, but, but still, um, you know, it's, it, and, and, and manufacturers are working to make this even lower. Um, washing machines have gotten much better since the 70s. They use 73% less water. Um, today's washers can range from using 10 to 30 gallons per load. So it's important to look at how much they're using. Um, we just chose an Energy Star one that, that uh, uses 2.6 gallons per load. And no joke, we just bought Energy Star um, and didn't really look at how much water it was using. And so I was really surprised at how low it is. And it does, it does a great job. It takes longer to do the load. It's a, we have a front loader, and they used to be much better than the top loaders, but top loaders are now also pretty efficient as well. Um, so it's just always good to take a look at how much your uh, your washer is going to use. Fixtures as well. Um, our house is cubist, 
And so, so we kind of chose things that would be cubist along with it. And uh, I wanted a toilet that was basically just a white block with a lid on it. Um, and uh, my wife vetoed that idea. Um, and she said, all we're going to do with this toilet is teach your friends to, to pee in igloos. Um, <laughs> you know, coolers, ice coolers. So we compromised and, and came up with uh, something that was still blocky but looked more like a toilet. But the real special thing about this toilet is uh, dual flush. So, so uh, you, know, you hit the little button for, for uh, yellow and you hit the bigger button for for uh, yellow and brown. Um, sometimes I wish there was a Tex-Mex button. You know, you just get the extra power boost. Um, but uh, but this this uses much less water. So you know, really old toilets use about seven gallons per flush. Uh, federal standards require toilets no more than 1.6 gallons per flush. If you get a high efficiency toilet, uh, 1.28, and when you go dual flush, they average out to 1.1. Um, dual flush toilets got a bad rep when they first came out because they uh, uh, didn't flush very well. Um, so people would have to flush them twice. They've gotten much better. Um, the thing to note is if, if you get a dual flush toilet, don't get one that's been hobbled together from different parts. You want to get a name brand um, where everything is designed to work together because the geometry of the bowl and how water uh, shoots into it uh, all has to be worked together. Um, other fixtures, uh, water sense rated, so no more than two gallons per minute when you turn it on. Um, so it keeps you from um, putting a lot of water. This uh, the shower head is rather amazing. Um, when when we were building our house, we lived downtown, and the shower had a 1.5 gallon per minute shower head on it, and it was like getting to a fight every morning with a spitting asp because it, it hurt to take a shower. Um, and then when we moved in our house and chose fixtures. I chose this fixture up here. And I counted this morning when I was taking a shower, there's 66 emitters on it. And, and it, it's like Niagara Falls. It's, it's unbelievable. Two gallons per minute. I didn't believe it. Took a bucket, two gallons per minute. I was fortunate enough to go to a, a water charrette in a Racine, Wisconsin, and the meeting was held at, at Frank Lloyd Wright's wing spread. And um, room of 40 people and I wind up sitting next to a, a Kohler engineer and this, this these fixtures are Kohler's and I was telling him I said oh man I love y'all's shower head and he goes which one do you have well he was the one that engineered it he was the engineer on that shower head yeah, and he said it took two years of engineering and figuring out how the water comes in and designing the emitters to get to, to get that shower head and I told him I said you need to do like a one gallon per minute because I mean if you reduce that by half uh, I think you'd still get a pretty good shower. Speaking of showers, in, in our house now, um, showering is about 50% of our usage um, compared to toilets and other usage. Um, and, uh, and if we reduce our shower time, we see a noticeable decrease in our gallons per person per day. Um, and, uh, and so one day, and I hadn't thought much about how I take showers. I think. I think we take showers you know, probably when we first started taking showers back when we were in school and developed our habits on taking showers. At least that's how it worked with me. And until you sit down and kind of do a process assessment, um, you don't really know what's going on. You know? Plus, you're not exactly, at least I'm not exactly in the, my best uh, frame of mind when I crawl out of bed and jump into the shower. And so, so I did a shower. So, oh, I got a timer. And you know, the suggestion is less than five minutes. So I was really surprised and disappointed that I was taking 10 minute showers. So I'm like, holy cow, what am I doing? So again, I did a process assessment. And you know, one thing is that I start from the top and go down and between every step, you know, if you start at the top and your, your face is all lathered up with shampoo, well, you gotta rinse, you know, and then you, then you kind of work your way down and rinse some more. The other crazy thing I did was I would shampoo my hair and then you know, your hands are full of suds. So I'd, carefully rinse my hands off, you know, rinse my face off so I could see my hands to make sure all the suds was off my hands, and then I'd rinse my hair. <laughs> it's just a, a waste of time. So, so I was like, okay, I need to re-engineer how I take a shower, and so I'm like, okay, here and out, I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up, and then not do this unnecessary rinsing. And I uh, got my shower time, you know, less than five minutes, and if I'm really focused and thinking, I can get out of there less than three minutes. And 
So I'm trying to inspire my wife. I'm like, honey, I did this. And she's an engineer. I'm like, honey, I did a process assessment. And da 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 And I reduced my shower time because I noticed she's in there on average about 12 minutes. <laughs> um, and, uh, and she's like, oh, good for you. <laughs> and then I, and I came back another time, and I was just like, hey, I'm, I'm down, down. Yeah, I can get it down to three minutes. She goes, great. That means I can take a longer shower. <laughs> Showers are really, really tough to change people's behavior. Um, you know, because that's uh, mental health space a lot of times for folks. I know I typically do my best thinking in the shower. Um, and, and so, but by the time now, if I take a quick shower, it takes too long for my mind to uh, wind up. Um, but I found other ways to, uh, to get around that. But, you know, going from 10 minutes to 5 minutes uh, saved 10 gallons per day. Which, which lowered our per capita water usage from 35 gallons per person per day to 30 gallons per person per day. So we can have a pretty dramatic uh, impact. But I'm going to look for a shower head that maybe does one and a half one. That way my wife can still take those long showers, longer showers. Um, and uh, we had a discussion this morning about this. And she goes, well, you know, there's people that take 30 minute showers. And I'm better than them. And I'm like... I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's like comparing yourself to Hitler. You know, it's like I'm a better person than Hitler, so I don't need to do, don't need to work to get better. I'm like, that's just a bad, <laughs> a bad comparison. Um, part of the reason I know she takes 12-minute showers is I'm part of Pecan Street program, which is uh, affiliated with the University of Texas. And uh, if you're part of their program, they'll install a meter, an additional meter on your water intake that gives you your water usage every 10 seconds. And so, so you can actually kind of see like what a toilet flush looks like, what a shower looks like, the washing machine, and then uh, figure out where your water use is going. It was through this tool I actually discovered that the neighbor during the week, during the work days when I was at work, was using uh, um, our hose, outdoor hose, to wash his car. So. <laughs> but fortunately, we put in a, sh a central shutoff valve in our house, so I could, we could put an end to that. Um, one regret that we have in the house is that, uh, you know, we did work to put the water heater in a central place and we worked with the architects to, uh, maximize the, uh, or minimize the distance from the water heater to the shower and the faucets. Um, but it still seems to take a long time when we turn on the faucet. Um, and, um, uh, so I kind of wish, you know, we have some friends around the corner that have a hot water circulator. And so they got like a doorbell in their bathroom that uh, you hit this doorbell in their counter and it uh, turns on a pump that circulates the cold water in the uh, pipes and replaces it with hot water such that when you turn on the faucet or the shower, it's pretty much instant hot water. Um, now the good news is, is in putting together this presentation, I was looking for a graphic to uh, put up here. And uh, I found this device here that does the same thing, but on a local basis underneath your sink. And so, so what it does is it, it's an instant water heater, kind of an inline water heater. And so you turn on your faucet, and you got uh, you know that much the drain before you get hot water because this is heating it. But it's also taking a look at the water that's coming in, measuring the temperature. And so as soon as your centrally heated water comes in, it shuts off and then you're getting that water. So we're going to look into putting that into our house and that can uh, reduce our water consumption even more. One thing we did not do at our house was gray water harvesting, which is basically capturing water from your sh um, shower, um, your um, uh, sink, bathroom sink, um, possibly your, uh, your uh, clothes washer, and then distributing that outside. <coughs> or perhaps maybe bringing that in and putting it into your toilet tank for flushing. Um, we didn't do that uh, in part because it's pretty onerous to do that with the city. There's a lot that goes into doing this with the city. And furthermore, um, my position is, is that water that goes down the drain is not being wasted. Um, and, and I would argue that putting water outside um, for irrigation is getting wasted, um, especially if you have a rainwater system. The reason I think that it's not being wasted when it goes down the drain is because it goes to the city of Austin, it gets treated, some of that water is being reused in the parks or for other purposes, and then some of that water is going back into the Colorado River. 
And that water that's going back in the Colorado River is meeting environmental, downstream environmental flow needs. Um, my personal opinion is that if you can use gray water to put into the toilet tank, that's probably a, a, that's a good use because that water doesn't get consumed um, through evaporation with plants. There's also studies that have shown that uh, people that have that have done um, gray water harvesting use more water, use more city water, because they wind up putting in plants and gardens to use the gray water. But if you don't have enough gray water, they supplement that with city water. So Austin's really big on gray water. That's great. But, uh, but don't feel bad if you don't want to do this. Um, I would argue that the water that goes down the drain is not being wasted. Um, and here's, here's kind of a reuse thing. This is an actual toilet you can buy. Um, where, uh, you know, you do your business, you turn around real quick, and you wash your hands, and that helps to fill up the tank. So it's kind of a reuse. Um, something we haven't done at our, our house that uh, I hope to do just, just really from a wildlife watering aspect is kind of raising up our condensate drip line from our air conditioning and, and putting that out there. And, um, for, for bigger buildings, such as the Estonian downtown, they capture 33 million gallons of water a year. Um, they looked at doing rainwater harvesting, but skyscrapers don't have a big footprint. But the air conditioning produces a lot of water, condensate water. And so they use that water to do all the irrigation at the Austonian, um, which is pretty dang cool. And Austin now requires buildings that have um, air conditioning systems that are more than 200 tons to collect condensate and use that for uh, irrigation. Or that can also be used for toilet flushing or urinal flushing. So to conclude, um, Texas and Austin are growing rapidly. We're going to need more water. The least expensive water is the water we have. And so if we conserve that, that's going to save us money in the long run. Um, Xeriscaping can reduce household use by a third. But uh, getting Energy Star appliances, water sense fixtures can reduce household use by another third. Um, and reducing indoor use by half. And then sometimes love or avoiding an ugly divorce is more important than five gallons per capita daily. <laughs> Just you choose, choose your battles. And if everyone lived like me, we would save an extra 2.1 million acre feet of water a year. I don't expect everybody to live like me, but, um, but we can certainly use water more efficiently. Um, going forward, and there's a lot of room, of room potential, we can save seven out of every 10 gallons we use. Dr. Robert Mace, uh, Texas State University Meadow Center, thank you for your presentation today. Thank you for your great work and encouragement. Thanks, sir. Thank you.